God is good, amen? And he gives us rain in due season, Scripture says. Scripture says that he causes it to rain on the just and the unjust alike. You know, I mean, God is just. He's not fair, <laughs> but he's just, amen? David prayed oftentimes that God would strike his enemies on, his, on their jawbone and break out their teeth. That's what David prayed. God, strike my enemies on the jawbone and break out their teeth. Have you ever prayed that? Would anybody ever say honestly, I, okay, I've prayed that a couple times, you know. You know, but God never brought that to pass, did he? I mean, uh, and, and, and it's good that God doesn't listen to our prayers when we pray such prayers like David prayed. But I didn't have people pursuing me to kill me like David did, right? I mean, David's enemies weren't people that just talked about him. David's enemies were people that wanted to kill him. They wanted to destroy him. And, uh, and I'm thankful that Scripture says that God is for us and not against us. He's for us and he's on our side. Even when times are hard and difficult and there's trouble. Amen. God is for us and on our side. And uh, I just want to share a little bit this morning and and there's there's plenty of seats up here in the shade if people want to move or can't see but uh we got a lot of shade this morning how many how many like the the new concrete that we've installed amen amen uh, it helps with the outdoor service to have all this luxurious concrete and uh, we've got one more section to pour that we hadn't intended to pour and that'll happen tomorrow lord willing uh but uh, uh, we have some plans to do some landscaping out front at the road. It, you kind of noticed that we've, we've started doing, moving in that direction. And the Greenville City, uh, the, the town of Greenville put us up a, a nice uh, uh, light out there at, on the pole right there in front of our, our property. And it looks awesome. It, our our property is now lit up at night and it's not pitch black and dark and scary so uh uh that's a good thing amen god is god is doing great things and there's progress happening and uh and i'm thankful for that amen uh, so i just want to start this morning uh and i want to share a little bit a little bit of history with you this morning about green county um uh, green county is located in the southwest portion of northeast tennessee with a total of 624.11 square miles. 624.11 square miles. It is the fourth largest county in East Tennessee. Fourth largest. If you were to, if you were to look at linear, linear feet, if you were to take 624 miles and lay them end to end, that would be from here almost... Uh, to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, or in between Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and Miami. I mean, that's a long way. That is a long six. I mean, that's a big county. Amen. And and we're how many how many miles of roads does Green County have? I mean, it is a huge amount of roads. Uh, it includes six hundred twenty-one point six nine square miles of land area and two point four two square miles of inland water area. We have two point four two square miles of, of river and water area uh, also a part of the Cherokee National Forest is 38.52 uh, 38,523 acres which or 60.19 square miles which is a uh, part of the Cherokee National Forest Greene County listen to this this the settlement first began in 1772 uh, 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 organized settlement first began along the banks of the Nolichucky River in 1772. But there were pioneers that had been coming over the mountain for many, many years before that. Uh, when Jacob Brown and others relocated from North Carolina and established a camp on the banks of the Nolichucky River. Three years later, a large tract of land was established. Uh, three years later, a large tract of land was, was leased from the Cherokees by Mr. Brown. So Mr. Brown leased a leased land that would become Greene County from the Cherokee Indians. I thought that was very interesting. He did it right. He went and he did it right. He didn't take it from the Cherokees. He leased it from the Cherokees and titled as part of North Carolina's Washington District. So um, originally this area was, of course, North Carolina. In 1777, a Swiss immigrant, Henry Ernest, 
established Elmwood Farm alongside the Nolichucky River, establishing it as one of the oldest documented Tennessee century farms. Uh, the desire for a separate government grew with increasing number of settlers to the area through the efforts of Daniel Kennedy and uh, Wait Still Avery. I've never seen that name before. Wait Still Avery. Green County was formed in 1783 through a division from Washington County. So these guys said, we don't want to be part of Washington County or, or the Washington Territory of North Carolina. So they said, let's just break off and do our own thing. So the county is named in honor of Nathaniel Green, the Revolutionary War commander. And he was from up north. He, he was, I think, from uh, Rhode Island. Nathaniel Green was from Rhode Island, and they said, let's name it after Nathaniel Green, and uh, I'm sure he appreciated it, but he probably went back to Rhode Island, but uh, in 1784, Green County and Washington County, Sullivan County, and the Western Territories of North Carolina all participated in the creation of the state of Franklin, so in 1784, all these, all these uh, counties that were west of the, the mountains, they said, we don't want to be part of North Carolina. We want to be our own thing. And uh, <clears throat> so Greenville was designated as the capital of the state of Franklin. <clears throat> During this period, the people had divided loyalties and operated with two sets of government. <clears throat> government officials, North Carolina and the state of Franklin. Uh, <clears throat> During 1785 Constitutional Convention held in Greenville, uh, Split participation was evident and contributed to the collapse of the state of Franklin. So in uh, 1785, uh, when the state of Franklin came together in, in their Congress, some people said, we want to be a part of North Carolina. And some people said, we want to be a Franklin. And they got in a fight and argument, and then it, it just fell flat. It just busted up the state of Franklin. That's why they call it the lost state of Franklin, right? Um, uh, and then, so in 1789, North Carolina said, well, we don't want to, you know, be a part of North Carolina either. So there was bad blood. So after 1788, the Congress of, uh, you know, Franklin, um, the state of Franklin fell flat and they dissolved. Then North Carolina said, well, we don't want you guys anyways. And, and so North Carolina said, they're, we don't want them and they're on their own, uh, including Green County, Sullivan, Washington counties. So the federal government, uh, Congress of the federal government designated the area as part of the territory of the United States on June 1st. Uh, but then immediately following, uh, uh, in June 2nd, 17% of Tennessee was admitted to the Union as the 16th state. We're the 16th state of the Union, and Tennessee began with Greene County, Sullivan County, and Washington County. It didn't begin with Nashville. It didn't begin with Chattanooga. It didn't begin with Memphis. It began. Yeah, come on. Get, that's right. Volunteers right here. Tennessee began. Tennessee began with Green, Sullivan, and Washington counties. And I thought that was awesome. I thought that was a neat. I didn't know that. Maybe I was asleep that day when they taught Tennessee education in the seventh grade. I don't know. But I, that's pretty. I take pride in that. Amen. We come from a rugged bunch of people. The settlers that came across the Appalachian Mountains into Greene County, into southeast Greene County, and into the Nolichucky River Basin, and they were some rough-cut people. But they were educated, most of them. If you look back at Greene County's history, Greene County, as soon as it was settled, there was colleges and universities started in Greene County. Greene County has one of the oldest universities college universities in the nation Tusculum what is now a university it was Tusculum College and there was a Greenville College and a Tusculum College and those two combined I mean you need Mossheim had a college wait a minute well I want to just show you this uh listen to this hey we can get along with anybody can't we we can be friends tell somebody next to you we can be friends if we want to tell them that they can be friends on the lawn of the Greene County Courthouse are two monuments. On the lawn of the Greene County Courthouse are two monuments that commemorate the Civil War. Two, two, two monuments. One is dedicated to local troops who served in the Grand Army of the Republic or the Union. Greene County was mostly Union forces in the Civil War, during the Civil War. And the other memorizes General Morgan, known as the Thunderbolt of the Confederacy. <laughs> 
A lot of people don't know that the General Morgan Hotel was named after General Morgan, who was a Confederate. And uh, uh, Greenville is thought to be the only town in the United States that pays tribute to both the Union and the Confederacy in its courthouse square. We're different. I mean, we are different. Come on. We are a peculiar people. Green County. And you moved here, some of you. Scott and Alice. I mean, we were born here. You know? Somebody said I was born here. You know? Uh, we were born here. Praise God. Uh, listen about Mossheim. I want to share this real quick. In 1896, the village was known for being an educational and cultural center. In 1896, established early, very early on, the 1700s. Uh, but this is after World War II. I want to show you the cultural. It was it was first named Blue Springs. It wasn't first name Mossheim. It's first name Blue Springs. They changed its name later. Uh, the post-war. It was known as a cultural educational center for two post-war social developments an institution of higher learning and the development of that school into a college. Mossheim had its own college. The initial school was the product of a determined effort by enterprising local citizens. Its development into a recognized college was the result of sustained dedication and efforts by the Lutheran Church. Ah, hey, Jimmy and Judy, Jason. Hey, they brought some culture to Blue Spring, to Mossheim. Listen to this. Uh, the Lutheran Church, which purchased the school property soon after its, its establ establishment. The old college, a substantial two-story brick building, erected in 1870, stood north of the Big Spring. Soon after the property was purchased, it was named after a renowned German theologian, Lutheran theologian, Johann Lorenz von Mosheim. German. Mosheim. Everybody say that with me. Mosheim. Not Mosheim, not Moshim, not Mosheim, Mosheim, two syllables, three syllables, I Mosheim, that's pretty neat that next time you go through Mosheim, you need to think about our forebearers of Jimmy and Judy Raider, Jason Raider, <laughs> Miss D, how many remember Miss D, Miss D, she was Lutheran. Until she saw the light. But no, I mean, she, she was Lutheran. <laughs> Chicago Lutheran. But you know what? Green County was established by some strong, educated, tough-minded, religious people who had relationships with Jesus Christ. Amen. And immediately, they relished the opportunity to, to practice the freedom of religion. And they started churches and they started schools. They started elementary schools, high schools, colleges, and university of one of which is still in operation. That's amazing to me. That's amazing to me. Friends, we have a heritage. Amen. There are people that lived here in Greene County for, you know, 250, 300 years. I mean, and, and we need to know where we came from. Amen. We need to know where we came from. And we need to be proud of who we are. And we need to do that not only as a city and a county, but also as a nation. Because the people that founded this nation, they founded it for many reasons. But among one was the freedom of religion. They didn't want the Church of England telling them how they could worship or how they couldn't. They didn't want the Church of England pressuring them and, and putting undue burden on them. They wanted freedom. And they came and they fought and they lived and they died for freedom. Amen. That's why we have a Memorial Day service. And that's why we recognize the veterans among us. Because they fought and served for our freedom. Let's just give them a hand this morning. <clears throat> One of the first settlers in Greene County was Anthony Moore. Who in, I think it was 17. <clears throat> I think it was in 1780 they credited him. For beginning a, a community that was near <clears throat> Henderson Station. Does anybody know where Henderson Station is in Greene County? <clears throat> I'm not sure, but I, I, I want to look it up and find out where exactly he started that, his community. Uh, but how many has ever been to a family reunion? Anybody? 
all of us been to a family reunion? How many's anxious to go to another one? Let me see your hand. Raise a few of you. You brave souls. That's a good thing. Uh, sometimes family reunions, they'll put, they'll have T-shirts. They'll be really organized, and somebody will say, "Hey, let's let's uh let's have T-shirts for this family reunion." You ever seen T-shirts for a family reunion? Uh, if you go to the beach, sometimes or you see them at Dollywood, they'll have the same color shirt and they'll have a slogan of the year and the name of the family. These are some of the slogans that people put on their family reunion T-shirts. We put fun in dysfunctional. <laughs> I thought that was good. Our, our family puts the fun in dysfunctional. One generation plants the tree, another gets the shade. I like that. I like that. Without roots, there can be no tree. I like that. Uh, I wish I could relate to the people I'm related to. I like that one. I wish I could relate. Family is like fudge, mostly sweet with a few nuts. <laughs> and then this one, my family is like a potato field. All the best parts are underground. <laughs> uh, I found I found this interesting, but I didn't put it down. It said uh, family reunions is the is the best best means of birth control. If you go to, <laughs> you go to family, I'm not having all these kids, you know. No, no. Uh, this one is something. Nothing is more awkward than a large family reunion. Half of the people don't know who anyone is. That happens, you know. And the other half know way too much about everybody. <laughs> Amen, Pat says. Uh, 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 let's see here. I'm going to preach in a second, I promise. Uh, a couple was attending their family reunion, and uh, they've been married for 78 years. You count up the math. You do the math. 78 years. At the banquet, everybody wanted to know how they managed to stay married so long in this day and age. The husband responded, when we first married, we came to an agreement. We can agree, right? We came to an agreement when we first got married. I would make all the major decisions and my wife would make all the minor decisions. And in 78 years of marriage, we have never needed to make a major decision. <laughs> uh, one more family tree. After 50 years of wondering why he didn't look like his younger sister or brother, a man finally got up the nerve to ask his mother if he was adopted. Yes, yes, you were, son, <laughs> his mother said as she started to cry softly. But it didn't work out and they brought you back. Moms know how to reply, don't they? Mama. That's a mama thing. That's a mama joke. <laughs> uh, God has a plan for each one of us. Amen? God has a plan for your family. God has a plan for your family. If you're in a family today, God has a plan for your family. And I pray in the name of Jesus that no weapon formed, no weapon formed against your family prosper. You are the blessed of the Lord. The Lord bless your family. The Lord keep your family. The Lord make his face to shine upon your family. The Lord be gracious unto your family. The Lord lift up his divine countenance upon your family. And the Lord fill your family with peace. This county is established. And we have a blessing of Green County today because of families. God began the earth with a family. Adam and Eve. Cain and Abel and Seth. And when God wants to do anything in this world, he does it through families. He doesn't do it through one man or two. He does it through a family, through a network of people who stand up and say, you're my brother. You're my sister. You're my mom, my dad, my aunt, my uncle, my grandparents. And I'm not going to give you up. I'm not going to trade you and I'm not going to give up on you. Amen. Family doesn't quit on one another. We keep going. We keep loving. We keep praying for one another and standing in the gap for one another. And we stay committed because that's who we are. That's what defines us. We're family. And, and you may be the Sutherlands. 
You may be the Blow family, the Raider family, the Finkel family, but you know what? We've been adopted into the family of God Almighty. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob is our Heavenly Father. And we are one today. I want you to look around the, a little bit this morning at the faces of, of people sitting here. You're going to see these faces for eternity because we are the family of God in Christ Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. There are graveyards full. Listen to me. If you want evidence that God is real, that God is, walk through any graveyard and look at the headstones of generation after generation after generation of people who was born, lived, and died and put their faith in an almighty living God. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses that had faith. They had not just faith, they had great faith. And beloved, in this last day, in these last days, we're not going to shrink back from faith. We're not going to give up Jesus and we're not going to give up our right to the freedom of religion. Somebody say amen. amen. We're going to raise a hallelujah. We're going to praise the Lord. We're going to bless the Lord. We're going to go on and be with Jesus and we're not going to go back. See, in 1812, the War of 1812, Great Britain came back over here after we defeated them in the Revolutionary War. In the War of 1812, they attacked us again and they thought we're going to get them back. And they burned the White House to the ground. They burned much of Washington to the ground. But did you know the president of the United States and the vice president of the United States and senators and congressmen took up arms and fought to protect Washington, D.C.? People around the nation grabbed their guns, their pitchforks, their shovels and anything that they could. And they fought the British. And you know what? They defeated the British and sent them back to their island nation. And you know what? They didn't try it again. They didn't try it again. And, and, and I say that to say this. In order to stay free, you have to fight for it. Freedom is never free. It never comes easy. Freedom comes at a cost. And comes at a price. And, the, and on, on the first or second time that we, we met and we walked downtown Graver, we walked up to, uh, to, the, to the federal graveyard where the soldiers are, are interned. And there was several monuments there and uh and i thought about that these men many of them gave their lives for my freedom for my freedom in the civil war maybe in the war of 1812 the revolutionary war in vietnam in korea in world war ii world war one and and see they gave their lives for us because they wanted us to be free. They wanted America to go on. Somebody say amen. amen. And they gave their fullest measure. And their last measure of devotion. So that we could be free in America. We can be one nation under God. And they left a legacy to you and I. And they left a path and an illustration. In order to stay free. You're going to have to defend her. In order to stay free. You're going to have to fight for her. <clears throat> And in order to stay free, you might have to die and give your life for this great nation that God established with the freedom of religion. And I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not prophesying, I'm not saying there's going to be a war. But beloved, we can't give up the rights and the freedoms that God has given us through the Constitution of the United States, through the Declaration of Independence. We need to stand up with boldness and say, I'm going to hold on to these truths that are self-evident. We're created equal in God's image. And we all have the rights that are granted to us. That men fought and died and gave to us. And we're not going to lose those on our watch. Somebody say amen. Those that fought in the war of 1812, they didn't lose the freedoms that the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence granted us in 1812. They didn't lose it during the Civil War. They didn't lose it. During World War I or World War II. Somebody say amen. They fought and they maintained. And we need to fight and maintain. Somebody say I agree with that. Listen to this. When a God wants to do anything. He does it through a family. This nation started through families. It started through the pilgrims that came over. At Pilgrim, Pilgrim Rock. You know. Plymouth, Massachusetts. 
families, just a few handful of families. The Quakers came over and started communities, families, all of these people looking for religious freedom. In the Gospels, John the Baptist, who is a cousin of Jesus, there's family, right? How many have cousins in this place? Let me see a hand. Do you have a cousin? Does anybody here have a cousin? Let me see a hand if you have a cousin. Anybody here have a cousin? Do you have a cousin here in this, in this congregation? Let me see if you have a cousin here in this congregation. John the Baptist, who was the cousin of Jesus, right? John the Baptist introduced his disciples to Jesus as the Lamb of God. John the Baptist introduced his disciples to Jesus as the Lamb of God. And I want everybody to listen to this and look at me. That's how God introduces Jesus into the lives of other people through you. Through me. That's the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. That's our job is to introduce people to Jesus. One of John's disciples in John chapter 1 was identified as Andrew. Andrew was a disciple, one of the twelve. Andrew introduced his brother, Simon Peter, to Jesus. Yeah. Family. It's not all bad. Family. Andrew said, I got to go tell my brother about this. And he went and he told, he told Simon, he said, hey, we found him. I found the Messiah. You need to come and meet him. Andrew, as soon as possible, introduces Simon Peter to Jesus. Andrew was also instrumental in introducing Jesus to James and John. And to Nathaniel. See how it works? We introduce Jesus to people who don't know him. Now, there are a lot of people that travel up and down this highway every week. And they pass by churches, but they don't have a clue what it means to be a Christian. They don't have a clue of what it means to be close to God. They don't have a clue of what it means to be feel the love and the thankfulness of God in their hearts. And we need to introduce them into the peace and the joy that we experience through Jesus Christ. Neighbors need to know Jesus. Andrew was also instrumental in introducing Jesus to James and John. Zebedee, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, Nicodemus, all of these and so many more Friends and family were all introduced to the saving grace of Jesus Christ and the indwelling power of God's Holy Spirit by someone else. Someone said, you got to see this. You got to feel this. You got to get close to this. This is powerful. This is awesome. This will take everything you've ever done and it'll throw it away. This will take every guilt, every shame, every condemnation. This will heal your body. This will free your mind. This will give you joy. This will give you peace. This will give you eternal life. The moment you get close to Jesus, you're going to feel it and experience the same thing I feel and experience. You're going to feel good all over. You're going to feel refreshed. You're going to feel renewed. You're going to feel born again. You're going to feel born. And that is why America began for the freedom of religion to say and believe just that. Psalm 68, 6. God sets the lonely in families. Psalm 68, 6. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. He brings out those who are poor and puts them into prosperity. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. The rebellious dwell in a dry land. In John chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, Jesus met Nicodemus by night. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Nicodemus was a religious man. He didn't know the love of God. He didn't know have a relationship with God. All he knew was the law. All he knew was religion. But he was, he was curious about Jesus. How many would say here this morning, I'm curious about Jesus? Man, I'll tell you what, I want to know more and more. I haven't scratched the surface of Jesus yet. I haven't scratched the surface of Jesus. I don't understand the King of Kings and the Lord of your Lords yet. And I haven't even begun to fathom the deep, amazing mystery that is Jehovah God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want to know more. I want to know. How many want to know more? Inquiring minds want to know, you know. And, and, and Nicodemus snuck in by night, and the, the meeting was probably set up by Andrew. Andrew was the, the PR person. And he got Nicodemus a meeting with Jesus in secret. There was a man of a Pharisee, uh, John 3, verse uh, John chapter 3 verse 1 there was a man of, of, a, of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews this man came to Jesus by night and said to him rabbi we know that you are a teacher come from God 
For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So he didn't say that you're the Messiah. He said you're a teacher. He didn't say you're a prophet. He said you're a teacher. He didn't say you're, you're uh, a miracle worker. Or that. He said you're a teacher. And Jesus always, he didn't, he didn't mince words. He didn't go around the bush. He always spoke right to the heart of the issue. He does that with you and he does that with me. Jesus will never ignore what we need most in our lives. I want you to see that. The, the, the fire, the eyes like fire that are, is Jesus Christ. He will always look past the outside and look upon the heart and the mind, and the spirit, and he'll see what we need the most. That's the way he works. He has a, 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 a gaze that pierces the heart and soul and goes right to the heart of the matter. And Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He didn't waste time. He just jumped right in because Nicodemus needed to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Nicodemus needed to believe that Jesus was the only way to God. Nicodemus needed to believe that the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of all the earth was standing right in front of him. Nicodemus needed to believe and know that he was in the presence of the Eternal One, the Holy One. Nicodemus needed to know that he was in the presence of the Almighty Son of God. He needed to know that he was in the presence of a healer, a deliverer, a man that can raise the dead and open blind eyes. He needed to know that he was in the presence of him who can walk on water and raise the dead. Nicodemus needed to know that he was in the presence of a deity, <coughs> a holy God. He wasn't in the presence of a teacher. He was in the presence of Jehovah. Hallelujah. Amen. The presence of God, the fullness of God bodily dwelt in Jesus Christ. And beloved, if Jesus is in you and I, then we are going to be set apart holy. We're going to be different. We're going to be pe peculiar people. If Jesus is in you and I, then the demons are going to flee. They're not going to stay around. Why? Because the holiness of Jesus is upon us. The countenance of God is upon us. And Jesus told Nicodemus, I'm no teacher. I'm the son of God. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Churches today will not stand up and say, pastors, they, they're afraid to say there's one way to the God of the Bible. Jesus said, no man comes to the father, but through me. I am the way, the truth and the life. And you're not going to find the God of the Bible except coming through me. Pastors of large churches will go on Oprah Winfrey and she'll say, is Jesus the only way to God? And they'll say, well, Oprah, that's a good question. <laughs> and it's a simple one. Yes, he is. Amen. Yes, he is. Jesus said he was. And I believe it. You know what? The God of the Muslims, the God of Islam, is not the God of the Bible. The God of the Hindus is not the God of the Bible. The God of the Romans, little g, the God of the Greeks, that's not Jehovah. The God of the Bible is the God of the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, I am the only way. And it's a simple question. And he told Nicodemus, I'm no teacher. The only way you're going to get to God is to be born again. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Poor Nicodemus, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? He was just lost. You know, he was just lost. I don't know if that was a rhetorical question or sarcasm. But Jesus probably just went, oh, God. Oh, poor Nicodemus. And Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit. How many have been baptized in water in this place? How many have the fresh living water of Jesus Christ, which he offered to the woman at the well in Samaria? Jesus said, if you drink of the water that I give you, you'll never thirst again. It'll be like a fountain springing up with rivers of life into eternal life. He's a fountain of living water, fresh, fresh living water. Don't you wish you had some living water this morning? Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, <clears throat> he cannot enter in the kingdom of God. 
that which is born of flesh is flesh and that which is born of spirit or the Holy Spirit. See, the spirit is capitalized. There's understood holy that is born of the Holy Spirit is spirit. We were born of a mom and dad, but our spirit was born a second time when we accepted Jesus and made him the Lord of our life when we began to walk with him. I want to share this with you real quick. Nowhere in scripture does it say, bow your head, close your eyes and accept Jesus. Scripture says that we are to teach people to follow him in everything that he's commanded. <clears throat> That's why we have to preach the word of God and we have to teach people to follow the word of God. Somebody say amen. No, nowhere in scripture does it talk about a sinner's prayer. But it talks about daily denying yourself, taking up your cross and following Jesus. And pleasing him who has called us out of darkness into light. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Don't marvel that I said you got to be born all over again. <clears throat> the wind blows. Listen to this. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. The wind blows. Amen. And we don't know where it's coming from or what, what it's past. We don't know what field or woods it's come through 10 miles down. I mean, we don't know where it came from or where it's going. We don't know where it started. That wind could have started in the Pacific Northwest and blew diagonally from from uh, from northwest to, to southeast. We could be feeling a breeze that that started way out in the Pacific Ocean. And where that breeze ends, we don't know. We don't know where that wind was born and we don't know where that end goes from here. And that's what Jesus is saying. Everything that's born of spirit is a mystery. And beloved, that's why we can't figure out somebody that is born of the Spirit of God and has Jesus living inside of them. And we can't even figure out what the Spirit of God is doing in us sometimes. How many, how many of you have been led by the Holy Spirit and you didn't know why God was leading you in such a way? <clears throat> if you've never been led by the Spirit and wondered where God was taking you, you need to put on your faith shoes and start walking. Because He wants to use you to reach other people. And introduce other people to Jesus Christ. That was the great commission that he gave to all of us. And disciples of Jesus recreate themselves. They make disciples. Amen. That's how it worked in the book of Acts. The book of Acts, the church didn't grow by the pastors going out and knocking on doors. It happened by a Christian ministering to their neighbor and introducing them to Jesus Christ. That's how it happened. And God has anointed us to do just that. And Nicodemus answered and said unto him, he said, so he said, uh, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. You can't figure them out. You can't control them. You can't understand them. They'll leave a, a comfortable position in Great Britain and they'll travel all across the Atlantic Ocean to start a brand new colony amongst a bunch of Indians and savages. You know, that's all that they thought was here then. And they'll do it all for the freedom of religion. I can't figure out those people. But they were looking for something that God had promised. They were looking for a way that they could worship God with no interference from a government entity. And you know what? They made a place for themselves and God enlarged their tent. And that colony grew to another colony, another colony, another colony. And then it became one day... A brand new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men, everybody say all men, all men. are created equal. Amen. Jesus completely destroyed Nicodemus's religious views, teachings and doctrine. He threw it out the window to please God. Tradition was the enemy of relationship. Everybody say tradition is the enemy of relationship. Imagine this, if you came to your husband or wife <clears throat> and you came to your husband or wife with a memorized pickup line and you came to your husband or wife with a tradition, well, honey, we're married. That means you got an X, Y, Z. You're probably not going to get a whole lot of loving. Somebody say amen. Probably not going to get a whole lot of of one accord and unity in the home. Why? Because the marriage relationship isn't a contract. It's a relationship. 
the relationship that we have with God, it's not a contract. It's a relationship. And that's exactly what Jesus told Nicodemus. Listen, Nicodemus, it's not about the tradition and the law and how many sheep you sacrifice or rams you sacrifice. It's not about blood. It's not about the altar. It's not about all the things. It's about how well you know and love God. That's how a person is born again. If we know when people are flattering us with empty words, how many, have, how many know somebody that just smiles and flatters? But inside, you really know, they're not interested in me. They don't really want to know how, what a day I've had. They're just fake. God knows when we're fake. Somebody say amen. God knows, when, God knows when we have no worship, no sacrifice of praise. God knows when we don't want to lift up our hands or our voice and say, thank you, Lord. And, and Jesus was telling Nicodemus, someone that is born of the Spirit is going to be full of the thanksgiving they're going to be full of the presence of God and they're going to be born again. They're going to be like a new person. God wants a heartfelt and meaningful relationship with us. Let's have an intimate relationship with the father. I want to share this testimony real quick. Michael's testimony. And these testimonies are on the second page of our e-bulletin. And you need to watch them. Because Michael went to church for, for many, many years. And he tried to be good. And he kept sinning and doing good. And he'd do good and then he'd fail. And it was like a vicious cycle. He would do good for a while and then he would fall. And he would feel guilty and condemned and convicted. And he knew that he was missing something in his life. He knew that he was missing something in his life. Reagan, could you come back to the keyboard? Because Jesus said, he whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Jesus said, he who sins is a slave to sin. That's what Jesus said. But he said a son is not a slave. A son is set free. He's not a slave. And he said a slave doesn't remain in the house of God forever, but a son remains forever. And he knew he needed the victory over this sin in his life. He was a young man. He was single. And he would go out and he'd party and he'd get drunk and he'd sleep around. And when he'd wake up the next day, he realized that he had hurt and offended the love of God. And the Son of God and the Spirit of God in his heart. And he was grieved and convicted. Let me tell you something, friends. Where there's no desire for holiness, every sin will be there. Where there's a carnal spirit, every sin will be there. In our churches today, there's promiscuity, there's gossip, there's carnal competitions, strife and envy. And Paul said, where there is a carnal spirit in a church, chaos and every evil thing will be found there and Michael didn't want that in his life Michael wanted more than anything to be an influence to his brothers especially his younger brother whose name was Laughlin I found that interesting his younger brother was named Laughlin and he woke up one Sunday morning after having failed God and was drunk so having a hangover he failed miserably and he went back to his old way of thinking and living he went back to the world for solace and to satisfy him, but it really didn't. It was empty. He wanted something more. He needed something more. He said to himself, this is all pointless. I can't live the Christian life. How many have ever felt that way? I just can't do it. He said, God, if you want me to go to church today, you're going to have to help me. I had prayed for months that my brothers would see the change and transformation that Jesus had made in my life. In the next 10 minutes, his little brother Laughlin knocked on his bedroom door and said, Hey, Michael, are we going to church today? Laughlin had never been to church with Michael in his life. Michael said, if that's not God helping me to get to church, then I don't know what is. He got up and he put his clothes on. Yeah, that's great. You like that. He said, from the moment the sermon started, it was the most powerful sermon I'd ever heard in my life. The pastor was calling us to purity and to deal with the things of our past. You see, if we don't deal with the issues of our past, we can't move forward. If we don't deal with the issues of our past, we can't find freedom. 
the people that settled in the U.S., they couldn't move forward until they dealt with their past. And in 1776, they drafted a declaration of independence that said, we are separating ourselves from our past. We're a brand new thing. Listen to me. You and I can't be free until we deal with our past. That's why James chapter 5 says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you might be healed. In the paths of some of you today, some of us here, there's alcoholism. There's drug addiction. In the paths of some of us, in the past of some of us, there's adultery. There's fornication. In the past of some of us, there's bitterness and unforgiveness and hurt and offense. And the enemy will continue to use that today and tomorrow in our lives until we let Jesus make us new. Until we let him make us new. Gossip and all those things will keep creeping up on us and poisoning us. Anger, bitterness, resentment. But Jesus said, I want to make you new. 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 I want to take the hurt and the bitterness that you have because your loved one died too early. I want to heal that scar. I want to make you new. And Jesus can do it. Jesus can make you new. Jesus can make you new. Jay, Jesus can make you new, brand new. He can refresh you and refresh. Caden, Jesus can make you brand new. Brand new. That's the promise. That's the new covenant. That's the hope. He was calling us to purity and to deal with the things in our past, letting the Holy Spirit purify our past so our present can be free. If you want to know Jesus better, then you must confess your past to someone and let the Holy Spirit heal you. That's what James 5 says. If we don't let ourselves be made completely new, then the old will creep back upon us. The old man will come back and come back and come back. That's why Paul said we're to kill off the old man. He said the old man fights against the new man. And we have to fight for freedom. Somebody say amen. We have to fight for the peace of mind that Jesus said was ours and the joy. He said, I was completely made aware of all my sin. Everything I had done flashed before my mind. And I knew I was never going to be good enough to live for Jesus. When we really come close and get close to God, we begin to feel how unworthy we are. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, both past and present. And we realize I'm not worthy of Jesus. God is so much greater than I am. But the overwhelming assurance of God's Spirit within me made me to feel and receive the free gift of salvation by grace alone in Jesus Christ. See, we can try to go to church and be good, or we can receive by faith. And we can grab a hold of what the Holy Spirit offers us in freedom. He said, I've never cried that hard in my life. I turned around and there in the altar behind me was Laughlin, my little brother, with tears of joy in his eyes. Michael introduced Laughlin to Jesus, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of all the earth, that takes away the sin of all the world. And Laughlin repented and experienced the same powerful transformation that morning with me. The Spirit of God led Michael and Laughlin to an altar so that they couldn't just go to church, but they could be free. But they could have a relationship, a powerful relationship that sets them free. Some of us sitting here today, we know people who are struggling with sin. Sinners need to be in church. Praise God. That's what the blood was shed for. Sinners need to be in church. They don't need to be at home and on the golf course and at the lake. Sinners need to be in church because they're lost and they're dying and they're going to hell. And without the Holy Spirit, they'll miss God altogether. We need to introduce them to Him who makes everything better and makes all things new. We don't understand how it works. We don't understand where God is taking us. But I promise you, 
If you'll keep following Jesus, He'll take you to a promised land. He'll take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. He'll plant you in a body of Christ. He'll plant you in a family. And you'll be something special and something precious. Pastor Harris's testimony. Pastor Harris was not a pastor all his life. But he was raised in church. And when he got old enough, he went into rap music and drugs and selling drugs and alcoholism and prostitution. He went as far away from God as he could go. He made his bed in hell. And he was near death one night from overdose and alcoholism. And there were men seeking him to kill him. And he was laying there on his living room floor. And he remembered what his mom and he remembered what his grandma said. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. All that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he cried out one night. He said, save me, Jesus. Save me from sin, from drugs, from death and hell. Save me. And he called upon the name of the Lord. Call upon the name of Jesus. Listen to me. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That doesn't just mean from hell and eternity. That also means from calamity. I have testimonies of people who are driving down the road and a car came straight for them, a head-on collision, and they, the only name that they could call out was the name of Jesus. The only name that they could call out was the name of Jesus. And somehow that car veered off and they were spared a head-on collision. I've had people tell me of suffering heart attack and stroke and they call upon the name of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is praying for us in those moments. Jesus is praying for you in that moment. And Pastor Harris, he called upon the name of Jesus. Save me from sin, drugs, death, and hell. He said, suddenly I felt a peace come over me and I felt new. I felt a peace, a calm come over me and I felt brand new. I felt different. I thought different. Everything looked different. The sky, the flowers, the birds, and even the air I breathed. It felt new and fresh. And there was something different about it. He said the next morning I awoke. And I didn't have a hangover. And I wasn't in a, dr a, a drug induced state. The next morning I woke up. And I had not one desire to take drugs. To sell drugs. I didn't have one desire for a prostitute. Or for rap music. He said I walked out of darkness that morning. And I walked into the light of my new life. My new life. He said, I did go back to the club. I did go back to the darkness. He said he had a $10,000 tab at the bar. He spent so much drug money there that they knew him. And they gave him as much alcohol as he wanted. He said, but when I went back in there, I told him, Jesus changed me. Jesus, Jesus saved me. And in the first month of Pastor Harris's conversion, 300 of his friends were saved, baptized, and added into a discipleship program. 300. <laughs> 300. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6, Samuel said, When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you, you will prophesy and you'll be turned into a new man. A new man. When the Spirit of God comes in and fills you, you won't walk the same. You won't talk the same. You won't be the same. You'll be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit within you. And everybody will know there's a change. Listen to this. One more. I close with this. Brent's testimony. He said, I was in jail again. I've been in jail all my life since elementary school. Nothing was working and I was near suicide. I wanted to end my own life. In my jail cell, I fell on my knees, my mind racing, full of anxiety, and depression, and anger and rage. Angry at mom and dad, abandoning, angry at family and friends and school and society, full of wrath and anger. I was so mad, I was so full of rage. In my jail cell, see, he was bound and captive, he wasn't free.
Sin does that to us. Unforgiveness and bitterness and anger and rage does that to us. It keeps us in bondage. But Jesus said, I came that you might be free. Don't you want to be free? You're going to have to fight for it. You're going to have to pursue Jesus to get it. I got on my knees in my jail cell and cried out to God, save me and save my life. Save me from myself. I said to God, God, I don't know if I'm going to believe in you tomorrow, but I believe in you right now today. If you can do anything with me, you're welcome to it. I said the sinner's prayer, what I knew of it, and immediately I felt different on the inside. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Michael, Pastor Harris, and Brent all experienced the rebirth that Jesus gives through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about going to church. I'm talking about being in love with God, being in love with Jesus, and letting the Holy Spirit refresh you and fill you up. Everybody just say that with me. Holy Spirit, fill me. Refresh me. When I set up, the whole world looked different. The whole, my jail cell looked different. Even the colors looked different. I didn't know what was happening, but I needed it desperately. I didn't want to hurt anyone at, at that point. I didn't want to hurt anybody else. I didn't want to fight. I didn't want to rage. I didn't want to be angry. I didn't want to hurt anybody else at that point. I was not angry anymore. I felt as, a, as if a great calm came over me in all my rage and anger from my childhood to adulthood. Adulthood, it melted away. You feel that breeze? The wind of the Spirit. I felt as if I had been physically nonstop brawling all my life, but I could just sit down and rest finally because of what Jesus did in my life. Beloved, we weren't saved to go to church. We were saved to enter into a fellowship and a relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit and to be free. We can't be good. You and I can't be good. But God can be great inside of us. And the Holy Spirit can fill us. And we can be transformed and changed. The river. Let me do it. Would you stand with me? Beloved, we're going to pray for our needs. And I'm talking this morning about, not about church attendance and not about going to church. I'm talking about what Jesus told Nicodemus. You've got to be born again. Something divine and from above has to be born inside your heart, inside your spirit, a love, a love that completely overcomes all every sin that so easily besets us. It overcomes anger and frustration, anxiety, depression, rage, unforgiveness, doubt, fear. It leads us out of darkness and into the brand new light of a life that's worth living. Amen. Many of these people were headed for suicide. But God intervened and Introduce them to Jesus Christ. Many of you could say the same thing. I was headed for trouble. Oh, but somebody, God intervened and somebody introduced me to Jesus. Just say that word with me, that name, Jesus. Jesus. Say it with me one more time, Jesus. Such a peaceful name. And you know what Jesus does in you and I, what we can't do in ourselves. He washes us and cleans us up through the power of the Holy Spirit. He changes our hearts and our minds, our spirits. We're no longer depressed, angry, full of rage and unforgiveness. But we're full of peace and calm. 
This song says, I'm going to take all of my sin and all of my past, just like Michael. He said, I couldn't move on with God until I dealt with my past. Amen. And so, it's true for all of us. We can't move on with God until we come to terms and let, let God heal us and forgive us. And we deal with the desires and the same trappings of the past. How many say, how many say this morning, I don't want to be the same old person I used to be. I want to be somebody different. I need to be somebody different. Oh, God. This song says, To the river I am going Bathing since I cannot bear And come and cleanse me Come forgive me Lord, I need to me Sing that first verse again to the river. Sing it out. And to the He's 
Thank you. 